Murar and Salam uh, alaikum Jamia, Murad Nukha. Thank you for you know, joining us today for uh, this uh, a little bit of an interesting topic, you know, antibiotic stewardship in an outbreak setting. Uh, so uh, we know that antibiotic stewardship and uh, infection control they are they go side by side when it comes to uh, reducing the resistance. Uh, especially from epidemiologically important organisms. But how this is significant in, in an outbreak setting, we'll discuss uh, a little bit about that. Uh, not just that, we will try to learn a little bit more about what exactly is antibiotic stewardship, what are the different interventions which we use in, in antibiotic stewardship, and also I'll try to give you uh, an idea of what are like the core components of an antibiotic stewardship uh, programs are. So uh, let's start. And as uh, Mr. Saad said, we can have the questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so we'll start by defining what exactly is antibiotic stewardship. So this is uh, a very simple uh, definition uh, that we have. Uh, this is mainly adapted from the American Healthcare Association definition. We have a lot of different definitions for antibiotic stewardship because antibiotic stewardship is relatively, uh, I would say, an emerging uh, topic. But uh, uh, recently we have uh, established not just the definitions, but certain protocols and defined the different uh, interventions and the overall structures. Uh, there is some sort of a, a, a unification or a standardization of how an antibiotic stewardship program should be. So how, what exactly is an antibiotic stewardship? So it is a set of coordinated strategies to improve the use of antibiotics with the goal of enhancing patient health outcomes, reducing resistance to antibiotics, and decreasing unnecessary costs. Sometimes they also say improving patient safety. As we know that uh, resistant organisms are also um, a health safety concern. So this, uh, this is basically the definition of antibiotic stewardship. And on the background, we know that the multi-drug resistant organisms, uh, they do pose a significant risk to our patients, especially when they cause healthcare associated infections. And then it is a patient safety concern. Uh, when it comes, again, we'll discuss that when it comes to an outbreak setting, we know that MDROs are uh, are horrible uh, uh, cases in an outbreak se uh, setting. So uh, antibiotic stewardship to prevent resistance, as we mentioned before, especially very relevant in an, uh, uh, for for the outbreak management in an uh, 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 for for any antibiotic stewardship program. So, uh, so antibiotic stewardship program has. Uh, like different components, modalities, um, documents, or arms, I would say. So just to uh, give you a little bit of the overview. So the main, uh, uh, I would say the organizational structure or the, uh, uh, the paperwork or the policies, procedures, and documentation that we require for any antimicrobial stewardship program is having an antibiotic stewardship committee. So the role of this antibiotic stewardship committee is to uh, not only to lay down the policies and procedures for an um, antibiotic stewardship program, but also to guide the antibiotic management team on how to work on those policies and if there is any, uh, if there are any challenges or concerns that arise during the work of the antibiotic stewardship program uh, to address those challenges. Uh, the antibiotic stewardship committee is usually sometimes a subcommittee of an infection control committee. It can also be uh, a subcommittee of your hospital's, uh, you know, pharmacy and therapeutics committee or any uh, general committee. Uh, and it has a wider membership, uh, which includes uh, hospital leadership, sometimes even uh, uh, along with your microbiology, pharmacy, infectious disease physicians, intensivists, etc., 
people from your IT team, people from your um, uh, finance department, if any you know, administrative or financial support is needed. But um, also for the stewardship committee, they assign uh, something which we call the antibiotic management team. This antibiotic management team is mainly uh, clinical uh, people with clinical roles, which include ID physicians, clinical pharmacologists, uh, pharmacist, drug, can be drug information pharmacist, can be uh, retail pharmacist, dispensing pharmacist, clinical microbiologists, um, other laboratory personnel, other clinicians such as nurses, may include uh, respiratory therapists, etc. So that's what constitutes the anti the, the antibiotic biotic management team. Uh, and then uh, the other things which are component of the antimicrobial stewardship program is your formularies, your uh, pharmacy guidelines, dispensing guidelines, therapeutic guidelines and protocols, how we go about, about educating people on education, uh, audits, etc. Uh, and then uh, mainly, as the name says, they deal mainly with the antimicrobials, mainly antibacterials, antifungals and antivirals. So part of your learning uh, to have uh, a working knowledge of how an antimicrobial stewardship program works is to review uh, two committee meetings for any ASP recommendations that were made. If the antibiotic stewardship committee is meeting separately, then they should have their uh, minutes there. If it's part of the uh, PNT committee or the IPC committee, then you might find some recommendations in those meetings. So whatever uh, is relevant to your setting, it would be uh, wise to go about and look at those and look for any uh, ASP recommendations that they have done. Also, maybe in the later afternoon, you can check with your, uh, uh, with your friends in the pharmacy and they should be able to guide you what's the, uh, the workflow for the antibiotics in the particular healthcare setting that you're working. So you need to trace uh, from the time an antibiotic order is placed either uh, in the form of a prescription or as an electronic medical record. And then uh, how the pharmacy receives that order, particularly order for an antibiotics, how they review whether it's uh, uh, it's a restricted antibiotic or uh, an antibiotic that is un unrestricted. And what happens particularly if it is a restricted antibiotics, what stewardship interventions they do, what's the process for approval, is it sent to some other members, particularly those members of the antimicrobial management team as we discussed, and then uh, what are the workarounds, what are the restrictions, what are, and most importantly, what are the interventions, what the, uh, the pharmacy team or the clinical pharmacy team does when they receive an order that has a restriction. So this will help you uh, understand the whole antimicrobial prescribing process, uh, which will be good for your uh, understanding of the stewardship program. Uh, anyway, so uh, we said, Antibiotic stewards. This is this is a little bit of an overview about uh, antibiotic stewardship program in general. But what happens during an outbreak? So whenever an outbreak happens, uh, especially that of uh, uh, of an epidemiologically important organism or an infection, for example, and then we expect a surge in the antibiotic prescriptions, and then because outbreaks often can lead to a sort of a panic situation. So then the indications might be overlooked or proper indications for prescribing the antibiotic prescriptions uh, overlooked. So that's where the infection control program kicks in. So the ASP program and the IPC program shake their hands here in the, especially in an outbreak setting, uh, especially those of the epidemiologically significant organisms. So uh, we as IPC, Infection Prevention Control Professionals, uh, in cooperation with our clinical pharmacist, we are here in an outbreak situation making sure that the infection 
which is uh, infection in question during the outbreak, we get effective treatment for it. We mitigate any resistance response by uh, making sure that the antibiotics being prescribed are correct and effective, and thus improve the antibiotic efficacy while preventing the resistance. So we'll see how. So uh, here, you know, not just in an outbreak setting, but in general, these are the three objectives of an antibiotic stewardship program. So we're making sure that we optimize the antibiotic use. We choose the right antibiotic dose and duration. Uh, we'll discuss this in detail when we study more uh, about the, uh, uh, the different modalities of antibiotic stewardship. And again, we are here, secondly, minimizing harm. So we are preventing secondary infections, which are sometimes you know related to antibiotic use, such as Clostridium difficile. So we know that antibiotics, while they can, they are excellent agents treating infections. Uh, they might, in this case, for example, in Clostridium difficile, eradicate the the normal flora of the gut, uh, disturb the uh, the biological uh, balance, and cause these uh, potentially uh, difficult to treat uh, infections such as Clostridium difficile. Uh, to uh, uh, to cause uh, infection and severe symptoms in our patients. And also, uh, since uh, prescribing antibiotics irrationally can promote resistance, so what we are doing with our stewardship is we are slowing the, the spread of the resistant bacteria in an outbreak. Uh, in an outbreak setting, particularly three modalities are very, very important uh, when it comes to uh, antibiotic stewardship. There is something called uh, a diagnostic stewardship also, which means that we not only give the, the correct medication, but a correct uh, diagnostic test or a, an appropriate diagnostic test as well. So now um, diagnostic stewardship and antibiotic stewardship are being now considered as uh, uh, supplementary or complementary things to each other. So having correct diagnostics is again very, very important. Uh, that's our first part in an outbreak setting. So we know that in an outbreak, uh, we've had many examples, for example, COVID-19, influenza, uh, we'll see later as well. Uh, they have uh, had sort of a diagnostic dilemma. We've, we've been facing a diagnostic dilemma when it comes to diagnosing uh, infection, especially in an outbreak setting. So. It's very important to distinguish in an outbreak, whether it's bacterial or viral, especially if it's an outbreak of a respiratory illness. Because in viral infections, usually antibiotics are not needed. But in bacterial, we need antibiotics. How would we distinguish? Sometimes clinically, uh, although uh, we do know that some, uh, uh, some of the viral illnesses have some certain criteria, but again, uh, the overlapping of symptoms sometimes make it hard to distinguish a viral and a bacterial infection. So that's here the rapid diagnostics do come in. So if we have a test which can identify uh, in a matter of uh, like uh, quickly or differentiate between a viral and a bacterial setting, so that would really help uh, us to choose the correct treatment. So. It would help us make accurate treatment decisions and avoid the uh, unnecessary antibiotic use. And we know from our example in, during the COVID-19 as well, and before we used to have PCRs, which would take a long time, and then the physicians would start empiric treatment, sometimes often with antibiotics. But then when the, uh, the, the rapid testing, like the lateral flow or the rat test, rapid antigen tests, they came in, it really helped us in making better treatment decisions uh, and thus avoiding antibiotic use for patients, for example, who were positive for COVID-19, because we know from our, uh, our knowledge that uh, antibiotics would not be of any benefit. Rather, uh, they might even uh, lead to uh, adverse events. So for the rapid diagnostic, again, uh, we would want you to learn some some of uh, the protocols in your own 
a healthcare setting. So maybe you can go about ask your microbiology lab or uh, uh, your frontliners in the emergency room that what is the proto what are the protocols of specimen collection, how you process those specimens, uh, how you collect specially viral samples, what is a viral transport medium, which samples to send where, whether the lab has a capacity to do the tests in-house, are they sending it outside, do they need to uh, send certain samples even to the uh, reference lab like the public health authority labs, for example, uh, when it comes to, for example, musk uh, cov or even um, a COVID-19 sample for hospitalized patients, samples for monkeypox, for example. So these are the some, some of the things that you need to learn uh, so that you would understand what are the you know, the benefits of having rapid diagnostics, aiding your antibiotic stewardship program in an outbreak setting. Also, when you ask or study about these tests, ask about something called the turnaround time. So each test has a turnaround time. For example, a PCR might take uh, uh, a day or a few hours. Uh, rapid diagnostic tests are instant. They can even be done at the bedside. Some tests for monkeypox, for example, takes 24 hours to report. Some tests, diagnostic tests for uh, some of the epidemiological important organisms like CREs, for example, they take even longer. Tests for tuberculosis, especially if you do uh, quantiferon, for example, takes even a bit more longer. Some sp special viral tests take even sometimes more than a week to report. Sometimes you also want to do some, some sequencing or gene uh, identification um, that needs even special labs and even longer turnaround times. So these, uh, it would be uh, wise or uh, beneficial for you to get these two informations uh, from your microbiology lab mainly to understand these principles because these are something uh, which you need to have an understanding of when you're working in an outbreak setting. The rapid diagnostics or the turnaround time of the tests that you need to, uh, to order or request in an outbreak. Also, so one, an uh, outbreak has happened. Another important thing or important concept that you need to know with regards to antibiotic stewardship is the protocol development. So uh, protocol development means you have guidelines or policies for specific diseases and which antibiotics to use. So if having a standard protocol is always very, very important. So that protocol will help you uh, monitor. Mr. Amar. Yes, Sabra. Uh, the first one uh, before this slide, uh, with the uh, with the sound, it's not clear. It's cut. Okay. Yeah. So Please, you can repeat this slide. Is the sound is the sound better now? Yeah, yeah. This now. It's okay. Okay. So uh, we were talking that, especially in an outbreak setting, uh, we need to have three key ASP strategies in place, which are very relevant to uh, an outbreak setting having rapid diagnostic, protocol development, education and training. So for the rapid diagnostics, uh, it is very important that we have tests available, which can help us readily identify the culprit uh, bacteria or a virus for that. Because uh, usually, especially in, an, in a respiratory disease outbreak setting, we know that most of the outbreaks are, are mainly caused by the viral infections. We have a very uh, recent example of COVID-19 where it is a viral infection and then we know that antibiotics do not work or rather harm when used in a viral infection. So having a rapid diagnostic in terms of a test that would rapidly or readily identify uh, the uh, the culprit organism 
would make us make it easier for us to do faster and accurate treatment decisions. So we remember that initially when COVID struck, we had uh, we were relying sometimes on the PCR, which had a very long turnaround time, sometimes even uh, from as long as 24 to 48 hours, and that would sometimes delay uh, the treatment that we would give to those patients. So with improved diagnostic, then came the lateral flow test, the rapid antigen test, uh, our ability to readily identify and diagnose this particular infection increased. So that helped us in, uh, in making accurate and timely treatment decisions. And that prevented the use of uh, excessive antibiotics for patients who were suffering from a viral uh, illness that was COVID-19. So uh, rapid diagnostics is extremely important. So for you, uh, we have suggested uh, a couple of activities that you should be doing that you should learn. You can go to your microbiology lab. You can go to your frontline staff. You can go to your emergency room. You can go to your uh, your uh, respiratory uh, uh, triage area, etc., where you can learn how or what are the protocols used for collecting samples, how you receive those samples uh, for uh, for testing, be it rapid testing, be it a, a request for a PCR, or even for advanced cultures, etc., how they process the culture plates. And then or even uh, you can learn that for which uh, diseases, for example, some of the epidemiologically important diseases that currently you might not have uh, a test which is done in-house in your lab may be sent outside sometimes even to a reference lab like the the central labs or public health authority labs etc and there should be there must be uh, protocols in place in how to deal with those testing especially uh, when it comes to a surge in cases or with cases which uh, have uh, epidemiological significance uh, in terms of causing outbreaks as well so it's going to be a good uh, learning opportunity for all of us if we go and learn those, uh, not just the specimen collection protocols, but how we deal about processing those samples, how we interpret those samples, how, how we go about sending, dispatching those samples to an external or a partner lab if needed. And also an important uh, concept as we learn, as we are talking about rapid diagnostic tests. So each test has its own turnaround time can be up to days, it can be up to hours, it can be rapid done at the at the bedside with no turn around time at all. So that again is very important concept to learn uh, when it comes to our outbreak response. We are, when we are responding to uh, or when we are sending a lab, how much to wait, how much time we're going to wait uh, before we can have the test result because that would uh, determine what interventions are we going to do. Are we going to wait for the lab to come back or is there something which, which we can do while we wait? For example, starting an empiric therapy, starting uh, sometimes, you know, in an influenza outbreak, you don't need to wait for the definite lab test to come back. You start your empiric management uh, before waiting for the the exact culture results or uh, rapid diagnostic result or whatever modality and no, no, non-culture based results to come back. And then once you have the definite diagnosis, then you uh, can modulate or modify your treatment accordingly. So you might have seen that whenever there is a case definition, sometimes the treatment protocols would say that even if you have like a suspected case, uh, you can start empiric treatment. You don't have to wait for the lab confirmation of uh, of the test because most of the time, especially for some of the viral illnesses, the turnaround time for the lab test is is quite longer, and the treatment cannot really delay. And also, sometimes you need uh, to initiate treatment uh, to prevent further transmission of the disease as well. 
So rapid diagnostic is very important modality for antibiotic stewardship in an outbreak setting. The second modality is the protocol development. So once you establish an outbreak, uh, as usually your hospital or your setting would have uh, clear protocols for some of the epidemiologically important organisms, which will also have some provisions in a surge setting. So if you have like increased number of cases of a certain uh, disease, what protocols to follow? Having clear protocols is very important because it would give you exactly what to do uh, for the empiric therapy, as we mentioned, while you wait for the test to result to, to come back. What are the de-escalation protocols? So if uh, you've already started the antibiotics for any particular uh, disease. How would you de-escalate if the lab results or if the clinical condition demands so? For how long you're going to give uh, the antibiotics for that particular uh, disease? And what are the restricted antibiotics? You need a more expert opinion or uh, sometimes an uh, ID consultant in uh, coordination with the ID pharmacist to prescribe drugs. So uh, for the protocol uh, development, for you to learn um, how or how these protocol works, you might want to look at the antibiotic stewardship policy in the healthcare setting that you're currently working on. What are the ASP guidelines currently that you have for different uh, diseases? Uh, for example, uh, when we had the uh, the COVID-19, the, uh, the public health authority, uh, the other health regulatory authorities, they were sending renewed treatment guidelines um, and treatment protocols for different uh, severities of the diseases. And also uh, to uh, learn uh, some of these components, you might want to look at the different pharmacy lists that you have. There might be uh, lists, which is which is as I mentioned, the restricted antibiotic list. Some of some uh, uh, of the hospitals, and the MOH in general has this standardized antibiotic uh, indications and uh, treatment guidelines, which has uh, uh, recommendations regarding which empiric antibiotics to prescribe, and once you have a definite treatment, uh, which protocols to follow. Also, sometimes pre-surgical uh, antibiotic prophylaxis guidelines are part of those li uh, lists. So your pharmacy will have uh, like three or four lists specific about antimicrobials, that which antimicrobials to use in which indication, uh, and also some of your uh, policies which are related to the epidemiologically important organisms like MERS-CoV, COVID-19, monkeypox, etc even uh, viral hemorrhagic fever, Ebola, they would have a list of, uh, of medications or treatment protocols that your facility follows in those situations. So it will be a good activity for you to learn uh, how uh, an important uh, established policy or protocol is when dealing with such infections. And of course, uh, the third component in an outbreak set setting is education and training. So it is again two pronged. One is for your healthcare professionals. And again, it includes the current best practices, the latest protocols, uh, which are being sent by the, by the public health authorities or uh, regulatory bodies or, uh, or professional bodies about how best to treat a certain disease, whether in an outbreak setting or otherwise. And not just that, also we need to uh, educate our public as well, uh, that uh, how or if an antibiotic is uh, really necessary for that particular disease, what are the, uh, what are the different hazards involved with excessive use of antibiotics. So, uh, public awareness along with the education for healthcare professionals form an important component of our uh, ASP interventions in an outbreak setting. So let's just discuss a few case studies and then let's see how uh, how we fared with these uh, these two particular outbreaks and maybe we can relate a little bit more 
how we were coping with antibiotic usage during this. So what happened uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we discussed this already. It was a treatment confusion, like what exactly is causing this infection? And then is it a really COVID, not COVID, some other infection? So we, we saw a very high rates of antibiotic consumption uh, at the, uh, the peak of the pandemic. Especially, we know, uh, they use it for uh, antibiotics such as azithromycin was really high. Uh, and it's still being practiced, actually, uh, that whenever a patient is uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, they would automatically also receive an anti uh, antimicrobial prescription. So some of the physicians would uh, argue that they are preventing super added or bacterial infections. Uh, which is not always uh, the case because we know that mild cases of COVID-19, uh, unless there are some other risk factors, would go about by their own by simply by symptomatic treatment. So uh, that's again we saw uh, the MOH and globally also we saw uh, similar health uh, regulatory bodies come up with guidelines where they. Uh, did uh, establish case definitions about uh, COVID-19 so that we can differentiate COVID-19 from other infections, particularly bacterial infections, and then they emphasized on avoiding unnecessary antibiotics. So if you look at the, the literature also, uh, for the antibiotic prescriptions that were given to COVID-19 patients, especially for uh, in this study in an ICU setting, so this study found out that uh, most of the patients were prescribed antibiotics and uh, the ADE rate, which is the de-escalation rate for once they knew that, okay, the patient has COVID in the control group was 27% uh, in, in the COVID-19 group as compared to 52.2% in the control group. So patients who were suffering from COVID-19, the physicians were very reluctant in de-escalating the antibiotics or stopping the antibiotics altogether. So that's why we can know here that in an outbreak setting, the antibiotic stewardship interventions really take a backstage. So that's again where our roles come in in the education and developing the proper protocols and ensuring that antibiotics are given only to patients who only need it. Especially in also in the influenza outbreaks, Again, this is again differentiating it between uh, the bacterial infection from the viral. So, in influenza, also in COVID. Again, here, as we mentioned, the rapid diagnostic tests are important. So, now we, uh, in some of the settings, we do uh, the swabs for the influenza as well. And then, uh, with that, we are clearly able to tell that it's a viral infection and not a bacterial infection. So, instead, we should prescribe antivirals rather than antibacterial. So if in this study, we see that they uh, they studied how they can uh, reduce the antibiotics used in influenza. They looked at the challenges and the rewards. We know that if it's uh, influenza, if we go give antivirals like Ocel, Tamivir, Tamiflu, for example, uh, antivirals are not really known to cause uh, resistance. Very rare for antivirals to get resistance as compared to antibacterials. So, in the study, they said that if they would have given neuroamidase inhibitors, again, uh, the selection pressure because of the uh, the lack of selection pressure on the antivirals as compared to the antibacterials, uh, the antimicrobial uh, resistance would have been much less as we see uh, with the influenza outbreaks that we tend to prescribe antibacterials. So having a rapid diagnostic test which can readily distinguish uh, influenza from bacterial infection can help us prevent uh, the unnecessary prescriptions of antimicrobials and thus causing uh, resistance. So overall, if we see in an outbreak settings, what are the challenges and what are the their solutions for uh, antibiotic prescription? So we know in an, uh, in an outbreak situation, uh, our healthcare systems come under pressure. So, uh, 
So the solution for preventing this healthcare system coming under pressure is to strengthen our healthcare system. Probably uh, we had good lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now we see our uh, emergency rooms with more capacity, with more respiratory triages, with more expertise in rapidly isolating and um, uh, testing uh, patients who have acute respiratory illness. So uh, strengthening strengthening our overall healthcare infrastructure uh, is uh, one solution uh, for the for uh, that can overcome the the uh, the pressure that our healthcare systems can potentially face during an outbreak setting. Another example is expanding the the number of isolation rooms, for example. So this is again making our healthcare structures more adaptive and more resilient to any potential outbreak, especially of a, a respiratory pathogen. And the other challenge, as we mentioned also, is the lack of rapid diagnostic tools in some setting. So more research and uh, investment is needed in terms of development of rapid diagnostic technologies. And we can, uh, we already have like, for as we discussed, as we mentioned, an example from the COVID-19 that when the diagnostics improved, the diagnostics became more uh, rapid uh, with less turn around time. It reduced the pressure on the healthcare system and it in, in the improved the, uh, the way we prescribe the, the treatment, especially antibiotics for these patients. Uh, and then uh, this is unfortunate that in our, uh, in sometimes in our setting, in particular, you some of our patients, there is a, a bit of an increased demand from the patients themselves for prescribing antibiotics. So they say that if there's an infection, it has to be given an antibiotics. That again, when our uh, third component of the education and uh, training, not only for our healthcare professionals, but also for our uh, our patients and the public in general comes in to identify or to address uh, that challenge. So we as healthcare providers uh, uh, at different levels have different roles when it comes to optimizing antibiotic prescribing practical uh, practices. Again, uh, the cornerstone or the main, the very critical role is uh, with our physicians or what we call our prescribers. So they need to be aware of the protocols and they need to evaluate the necessity of prescribing the antibiotics uh, according to the guidelines and also to educate the patients if they don't really need an, an antibiotic. Uh, next is our pharmacists as well. So they have a supportive role. Pharmacists are always the cornerstone of any antibiotic stewardship program. And then uh, they're mainly responsible for dispensing and monitoring the therapy and to providing accurate drug information to the prescribers uh, when it comes to different conditions. And then us as infection preventionists, our main role is the enforcement of these protocols and policies. So this is mainly our role, that we monitor the antibiotic use and the resistance patterns and implement the stewardship program through tracking and analyzing the patterns, identifying trends in antibiotic resistance, and then implementing the different arms of the antibiotic stewardship program. So on the right side, you see here, uh, a little bit of a schematic diagram of what antibiotic stewardship program is. We'll discuss this in a bit more details later. But again, implementing stewardship program and overseeing is the role of us as infection uh, preventionists. Uh, and one way to doing it is through, of course, through surveillance, uh, not only that of the antibiotic resistance, but also monitoring the healthcare associated infection rates. So this is uh, anyway our core core work, uh, but uh, for us, we are the link between the prescribers, the pharmacy, and also uh, the, the end users or the patients that we serve by implementing the antibiotic stewardship program. Uh, and in the end, uh, what our role should be, along with our partners in the pharmacy and the clinicians, is to track the antibiotic prescription patterns, the resistance data, and the uh, clinical outcomes of those patients uh, that we give the antibiotics. And then 
uh, we can use various feedback mechanisms to improve and optimize the program through giving regular feedback to the physicians or doctors about how and uh, when they're prescribing antibiotics for different conditions. And we can also use make use of uh, electronic health records and real-time data analysis if available uh, to track the, for example, the unrestricted, uh, the uh, unauthorized orders, for example, uh, how we uh, like interpreting the antibiogram. We'll discuss that in a while as well uh, through use of technology. Uh, the uh, GDIPC has a very good uh, educational video on the uh, uh, on the website in the auditing unit. If you go to the auditing unit and look at some of the videos that are available there, so it has a very nice video about the antibiotic stewardship program, uh, which also discusses a little bit about the uh, interpretation of the antibiogram. So I would encourage you to take a look uh, on that, and it will also have some explanation of various uh, infection control audit standards that we would be employed for the antibiotic stewardship program. So that's worth taking a look. Talking of the antibiogram, I would say uh, that we'll just uh, discuss some anatomy of the antibiogram. That will about knowing the uh, about preventing the antibiotic resistance so how we would know uh, that in that in one hospital setting or one healthcare setting or even in a health cluster setting sometimes depending on uh, uh, on uh, which perspective you're looking at it uh, the facilities or the organizations or the clusters, they develop something which is called the antibiogram, which would explain that institutional resistance patterns uh, with regards to uh, the different uh, microorganisms, bacteria, and often uh, some fungal infections as well. Uh, not only that, it would uh, tell you also that which antibiotic classes are most used and most misused as well if uh, it uh, has that information. Uh, so it gives you the antimicrobial sensitivity information, the pathogens of interest, which are prevalent or the most isolated in, 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 uh, in our organization or institutions. And also it will tell you about the trends of various uh, drug resistance that uh, that you see uh, for those those pathogens. There are some rules uh, for an antibiogram and should be presented at least annually. Some facilities do it biannually, and like two antibiograms or every six months they would publish. Um, one of the uh, requirements that at least for one organism to appear on an antibiogram, there should be at least 30 isolates for that organism. This is uh, a requirement, but if it's a small setting and if you don't have enough data, it's okay to include organisms which are isolated less frequently as long as uh, they are making sense. And usually for one patient, if you do multiple cultures for many patients, usually the lab would only isolate or uh, report the first isolate in the antibiogram. Uh, and then usually in an antibiogram, we are only reporting uh, full uh, susceptibilities or resistance. We are not reporting the intermediate susceptibilities. Sometimes in the culture reports, you do see intermediate susceptibilities, but, the, though they, but these, they do not contribute to an antibiogram. So this is generally what an antibiogram usually looks like. Uh, so on the first column, you see the the different isolates. Usually the gram negatives and the gram positives are done in different tables. Uh, and then uh, in the second column, 
you see the number of isolates for those particular uh, bacteria. Let's, for example, uh, uh, for the let's see let's say uh, Proteus mirabilis. So Proteus mirabilis, there were 75 isolates in one calendar year or six months, depending. Uh, so in the other columns, uh, from third column and onwards, you see the the percentage of the resistance uh, against these uh, these organisms. So if, for example, if, uh, let me see if we can have have a pointer on. Yeah. So if you see here in Proteus mirabilis, so we have 75 isolates. 88% of those were sensitive to gentamicin. And here you see the term three and zero. So Proteus was resistant, to, was only sensitive to 3% uh, when it comes to tetracycline and 0% when it comes to nitrofurantoin. So our Proteus in this particular orga uh, organization or hospital was 100% resistant, all the isolates were resistant to nitrofurantoin. So this is the information uh, the antibiogram gives you. I'm not going to go into the details because antibiotic biogram has a lot of other components as well, but this is something that you need to, to know. So for example, if you have, a piece, uh, let's take another example, E. coli with 254 isolates, you can see that 94% of the time it's sensitive to gentamicin. And again, for the meropenem, it's 99% sensitive. So that's why for the ESBL, we have the meropenems or the imipenems as the uh, as the dominant uh, susceptible antibiotic. Uh, we see here that cefuroxime is 66% sensitive only to ESBL. Okay. So if you see a prescriber prescribe cefuroxime to E. coli, which is ESPL, this should raise alarms that this patient is, uh, or in your particular hospital, it's uh, the resistance against cefuroxime is high. Generally, cefuroxime is not really prescribed for E. coli, which is ESPL positive anyway. So if you see a antibiotic order with cefuroxime, and your institution has only 66% sensitivity for E. coli, then uh, you would interpret that cefuroxime is not the correct choice to be prescribed against E. coli. So this is just the basic information you need as infection preventionist to interpret your antibiogram. I know some of you have microbiology background and more advanced knowledge of the antibiograms but first just for the uh, for the uh, basic infection prevention is these informations that you need to know uh, sometimes you might have like a smaller uh, antibiogram to report depending on the setting and they would have uh, uh, these uh, these reports sometimes you see these blanks so the blanks is that because proteus Cefazolin it has intrinsic resistance. They would not do a sensitivity anyway for Proteus for for Cefazolin. But this is your role as an IP is that you should be able to give recommendations. So this is one very good example for having a recommendation for different organisms uh, with regards to the specific sensitivity or resistance patterns that you have for your uh, for your organization. For example, uh, the IP has given a recommendation here that for E. coli, based on the antibiogram that we uh, we check, that if it's not ESBL, then ceftriaxone, cefepime, and piptaz are likely to cover. But if ampicillin and salbectum are already started, then 60 to 90 percent would cover. So uh, having aminoglycosides with uh, uh, with the ampicillin is usually uh, then recommended to have increased the coverage to more than 95%. So for the antibiotic program, usually you, your role as an infection preventionist is to give or recommend 
uh, a particular antibiotic for a particular pathogen. And then when it occurs in an outbreak setting, for example, then this becomes uh, very significant as your aim would be to optimally and properly treat that infection. Again, uh, you as an infection preventionist in, as part of the antibiotic stewardship program should also recommend which antibiotics not to use. For example, uh, 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 we see here uh, that, uh, let's just take uh, an example here. Okay, so for a uh, gram negative, which has, for example, a particular mutation. So this is the initial empiric therapy, but you do need an ID consultation because CREs are not, not susceptible to meropenem or webrobectum. Uh, and that probably proves from your antibiogram as well. So you uh, consider consulting an ID consultant if you encounter a CRE uh, organism. Uh, again, uh, for example, if it's uh, acetinobacter, for example, then you see that the cefepine empiptas has uh, poor coverage. So, uh, and also meropenem has poor coverage. So, sulbectum is probably better choice here. And then you are also recommending adding a polymyxin B uh, to treat uh, uh, this particular species. So, antibiogram. You should be able to interpret, not just to interpret, but give your recommendations as well as infection prevention. Okay, so if we still have time, let's just discuss uh, quickly some of the some working knowledge about the antimicrobial stewardship. Anyway, you don't need to know the full ins and outs. You just need to know a few basic things. So we mentioned that the stewardship is about describing index to uh, prevent resistance, improve patient outcomes, improve patient safety, uh, and prevent harm to the patient. So what are the different modalities for uh, antibiotic stewardship? So one very easy way of uh, learning or knowing the, the, the different modalities of antibiotic stewardship is the five Ds. So five Ds, which we, we say the correct dosage means uh, uh, I'll, give, I'll give you to give an example for that. For example, uh, if you encounter uh, pseudomonas for a patient, uh, for one patient and for the other patient, you have uh, like a, a benign E. coli and you choose to give a cephalosporin a drug to, to both of them. Uh, the dose is different for pseudomonas uh, for that particular drug as compared to the dose that should be given to someone who has an E. coli or uh, any other uh, bacteria. So again, uh, we as antibiotic stewardship may need to ensure that we give the correct dose because again, if we do not give the correct dose for that particular indication, those bacteria uh, would not be killed, but rather they would become uh, mukawama or they would develop a resistance uh, against that drug and that drug will become ineffective if it's not given in the correct dose. The next is the correct drug as well. So as we mentioned, as we, as we saw in the, in the antibiograms, some of the bacteria are intrinsically resistant to drugs. For example, uh, those bacteria which do not have a cell wall, and if you give them drugs that work on the cell wall, for example, uh, uh, amino glycosides, for example, so uh, those bacteria will be not uh, not harmed by that bacteria. So we have to give the correct drug for the correct indication of the bacteria as well. Again, duration. Sometimes for one uh, in, uh, indication, the duration is uh, is more than the other indication. For example, if you have a deep-seated uh, bone infection with uh, any of the uh, gram-negative bacteria, you need to give antibiotic for, for months. 
as compared to a simple upper respiratory or an ear infection where you just need a five days of duration. Similarly, for the prophylaxis, sometimes all we need is just a single dose or one day prophylaxis. If you give excessive duration of antibiotics, again, that constitutes as uh, wrong practice or variance from the, from the guidelines. Again, for the diagnosis, uh, so you do not give antibiotics for viral infections. You do not give antifungals for non-fungal infections, for example. So having the correct diagnosis is very important. And once you have the correct diagnosis, that's when you decide you need to continue, you need to stop, and, or you need to de-escalate. For example, we thought it was pseudomonas. We started antibiotic in a high dose, uh, and then it turned out it was just a simple infection. So that's just an example for the principle for something the fifth D that we are mentioning, the de-escalation. So if you know that it's not as dangerous as you were looking for, so even if you have started empirically with a high dose with a uh, with a with a broad spectrum agent you should always narrow down to a lower spectrum a narrow spectrum uh, agent if you have given an iv agent you, you can switch to an oral agent if it is not a bacterial infection you should stop it or uh, so all of these are examples of something which we call the de-escalation so the five d's are the modalities that we uh, are the, the most common modalities that we see uh, in an antibiotic stewardship program. So once you go and look for the your antibiotic stewardship policies and protocols, make sure that this that your protocol uh, addresses or your policy addresses at least these five components of the antibiotic stewardship uh, program. So having these five Ds in mind, you will be able to evaluate how good or how comprehensive your stewardship uh, policy and procedure is. All right, so uh, again, uh, this is these are the working modalities, but overall, uh, uh, the antibiotic stewardship program is very comprehensive. Uh, and it has something which we call the, uh, the seven components or the seven elements of the, the core components of, the, of any antibiotic stewardship program. We're not going to go into detail. I'll, I just have put in some slides for you to know a little bit uh, more about the, the whole components or the ho whole working of uh, an antibiotic stewardship program in a healthcare setting. So it starts and ends with the leadership commitment. So having a uh, uh, proper antibiotic stewardship program, you need uh, your leadership to be involved. Uh, so the leadership uh, role comes not only in providing resources and support for your stewardship program, but also in making sure that the policies and protocols are in place for the antibiotic use. The other component is accountability. So whenever uh, individuals are uh, overseeing an antibiotic stewardship program, they are accountable and they have clear goals and assessments of the progress of that component and those working in an antibiotic stewardship program especially in the pharmacy and the microbiology have working knowledge of proper antibiotic selection restriction proper dosing uh, and then if there are uh, any challenges they should be able to uh, communicate or make actions for that change so that makes the fourth component of an effective antibiotic stewardship program and a tracking and reporting mechanism must exist, which is the fifth component uh, about antibiotic usage and resistance patterns, be it in the form of a antibiogram, whether they're, they're sending communications about restricted or unauthorized antibiotic orders in an organism, or the, the interventions, the number of interventions they have to do, pharmacy interventions, I mean. And then this data should be shared either with the ASP committee or the IPC committee, or within the pharmacy and therapeutics committee to make rooms for the area of improve, improvement. And then again, the core component number six for an effective antibiotic stewardship program is your education and training uh, in uh, uh, making sure that both the public, as we mentioned before, and also the healthcare workers are aware about the correct antibiotic use. And then the seventh component is again, the rapid or the regular review of your antibiotic 
practices and whatever you learn from those practices you should be adopt to change or modify your strategies accordingly so in conclusion uh, we can now say that antibiotic stewardship does play some crucial role in an outbreak setting not only to ensure effective treatment for uh, people who uh, are uh, for, for patients suffering from the outbreak uh, it minimizes the resistance it in, uh, maintains good public health as well uh, by educating them and uh, antibiotic stewardship in an outbreak is not an easy job it requires a multifaceted approach which involves rapid diagnostic clear protocols education and robust monitoring of the practices as well so that's uh, it uh, we've come to the